Welcome to another Tippy McMichael lecture. Thank you. So, um, welcome everyone to the Tippy McMichael lecture this morning. For those of you that were here last night, welcome back. And for those of you that are here this morning for the first time, uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, my name is Denise Greathouse, and I'd like to start this morning by acknowledging our gratitude to Tippy McMichael for her generous gift that made possible this lecture series. Upon her death, Tippy bequeathed a portion of her estate to enhance the life and the work of our church. The topics of this series are intended to explore a wide range of spiritual issues and to feature speakers of varied disciplines and different traditions. The series is funded by St. Paul's Permanent Endowment Fund, but additional support comes from parishioners and from friends of St. Paul's Church. The lectures are offered freely and to the community from which St. Paul's draws its life. However, donations are always appreciated, and if you'd like to leave a donation for, t for this morning's lecture, there's a basket in the front. Um, are the donations help us to sustain and grow this wonderful lecture series? If you would like to make a donation to the endowment, you can see me or Evan and give us, a, we'll be happy to give you the information that you need. Um, and so, oh, I do want to point out that we have a link that you can watch the movie Master of Light for the next three days. If you'll put your email uh, legibly written on the form in the front, I will be sending out the link as soon as I can get the emails typed up and sent out. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to our rector, Evan Gardner, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Denise. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to be together again. Um, it is such a delight for me, and I think for us, to have George Anthony Morton with us. Before we uh, begin, let me say a word to our online audience. If you're watching online, you will notice that the live stream kind of dips out for a little bit whenever we're showing the video here in the parish hall because artificial intelligence is really smart, but not smart enough to know that the co-creator of the film is the one presenting the film. So YouTube won't allow us to show clips of a copyright film without kicking off the live stream. So we have to dip out during the film and then we'll come back. So just be patient with us. And if you want to watch it again, uh, you'll notice those dips. But as Denise said, please sign up if you don't have HBO Max. If you don't have access to the documentary, uh, Mr. Morton has been gracious enough to give us a link to that video, a link that's valid for three days, so you can watch it at home or wherever you would like. Last night, I got to hear uh, George Anthony Morton talk about the role that art has played in his life and in the lives of those around him. Uh, today, I'm really excited to hear about the ways in which that art uh, is shining a light in places that need a light. But as we talked about after the session last night, uh, darkness as well. Um, light and darkness uh, for a Renaissance style painter means something different than I think many of us uh, assume it would be. And so I'm really excited to hear that. I'm excited to hear about Mr. Morton's commitment to using art to give people who are incarcerated or who otherwise might not have the chance to express themselves uh, a chance to explore who they are and share that with a wider community. Those are values that we hold deeply and I'm really glad to see them and hear them resonate in uh, George Anthony Morton's life. As you might remember from his biography, uh, Mr. Morton was the first African American to graduate from the Florence Academy of Art. He is an award-winning, classically trained, and a very talented artist. He's here to talk to us not only about his work as an artist, uh, a, a painter, but also his work as a filmmaker and what this documentary uh, means to him and, as we heard last night, as uh, a love letter to generations to come. Join me in welcoming George Anthony Morton back to St. Paul's. Oh, thank you. And thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, last night was great, and it's awesome to be before you all again. And I just want to 
welcome all the questions, all the feedback. This is a dialogue, and I'm blessed to be able to share, especially on a Sunday morning in the house of God, um, a house that is open to so many different values and, and cultural beliefs and differences. Um, I'm really pleased to, to really be here and, and learn so much. Um, and so I don't know how many of you were here last night and, or, how, or how many saw the film. There may be some overlap, but I'll try to offer something a bit different this time. Um, so the title of today, More Light, we'll learn about that um, as the lecture goes on. And I'm eager to share, so we'll just get right into the first clip. Thanks again. place I ran into was this gym. Thank you. Thank you. I, I grew up in the church, so um, a lot of those principles still follow me to this very day, and I, I definitely feel at home here speaking in, in a church as well. Um, and so how many of you heard of the Native American um, political prisoner named Leonard Peltier? So when I first got to Leavenworth, he was there, and he gave me my first set of paintbrushes. 
Um, I walked into the hobby craft area and he, he's an artist, he's still, he's still in prison. Um, and he had um, deer and elk and paintings on the wall that, that were cultural and meaningful to him. And he saw that I was interested in learning to paint. And so he gave me my first starter kit of art supplies. And from there, my journey in prison as an artist began anew. And I would continue to hone my craft uh, while I was inside. And for me, that became a very monastic experience. I really treated my craft as something sacred, like a very sacred practice, and embracing the, the, the monastic quality that, that prison has, or maybe had in my mind. I, I kind of psyched myself out. So I tricked myself into believing that it was this mo monastery or institute of higher learning, and it, it, strangely enough, it, it really worked that way. Last night, I, I spoke about how you can turn a, a hell into a heaven, or in this instance, a prison into a paradise through the power of the mind. And so I would read a lot of those books that, that encourage such thought. And it was a blessing for that. And so in this clip, you see me speaking, and, and please, again, forgive the language, especially on Sunday. That <laughs> I, I was not mindful of what the clips contain I, in that sense. I was just um, kind of wanting to impart the, the more elevated message. Um, and so I talk about when I got out of prison, I just implemented the same tactics. Um, tactics like when I would arrive at prisons like Leavenworth, where Leonard Peltier was, or one of the other several institutions that I, that I went to, I would just paint a picture and uh, put it on display for uh, the, the population there. Eventually, executive staff, the warden, they would all take notice and ask me to start painting for the institution. Um, and I, I, I did something similar when I got out. Like I showed you, I, I went into a gym and I guess in, in, in that way, I was still institutionalized, crazy enough to think the same stuff would work, but it did. I uh, painted a picture of the gym owner and um, it was recognized by a board member of a very prestigious school. And it just continued in all the books I read the words I took in kind of became flesh in my life in a real way, which was deeply humbling, you know? It's, it's, it was this realization that hit like, wow, this spiritual stuff really works. It's, uh, you know, I was learning these principles. I got out completely full and, and wanting to see how it worked in the real world. And I'll be darned, you know, it was always Whenever the student was ready, the teacher would appear in the form of a lesson, in the form of an opportunity, and people right there willing to uh, help match my effort. And so the same faith-based principles that, that I embody uh, really helped my life upon my reentry into society. Um, I started believing that, that it was real, and so before, I started uh, to this morning, I was asked a question about the supplies in prison um, and if, you know, what the availability, availability of art supplies were like. Um, and it was pretty scarce. They didn't allow certain things that they deemed to be a hazard, um, but we had access to quite a bit. Um, and it was all about what you did with it. So I'm grateful. I, that I even had the opportunity. It's weird, you know, I, I don't regret a single day of my 11 years in prison for that reason because of what I was able to turn it into. 
and it still feeds my journey to this day. So uh, with that, I'll open up for a few questions before we go to the next clip. Thank you for being here again this morning. Of course. How do you decide upon which medium you're going to use? Because I see you, you paint and there's drawing. How do you go about that? Um, the kind of the motif or the subject dictates uh, what medium would allow me to get my feeling out in, in the most um, efficient way or impactful way. And I'm fairly limited to a uh, traditional medium. And with the film, it was actually um, a change for me. And, but I thought of it as, in a similar way as um, just another medium through which I can paint. And so if you get a chance to watch the film, you'll see the cinematography, the entire form of it is an extension of uh, the way I see the world through traditional painting mediums. And we just integrated that seamlessly in a way. Um, but being a part of the uh, old master tradition, the Renaissance tradition, um, we focus on traditional mediums. And I really appreciate the slow building process um, that, that has come down. Uh, through us from, from the ages, but uh, these days I've been exploring some watercolor as well. Um, it's done some sculpture, but mainly it's just been charcoal and oil paint. It's the way I was taught. And yeah, it, it's, it's kind of seen as more serious medium. So I wanted to like go for the hardest, which was oil paint. And that's where I, I started at. And yeah, it worked out for me. What was it like to tell your story for the camera and have a, like a, a camera on you and drive around and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, initially it felt intrusive and um, kind of difficult actually. And it took some getting used to. I actually had to become friends with my cinematographer and co-collaborators. Um, and none of the material that felt self-conscious would even make the film. It, it wasn't until I was able to settle into uh, just basically forgetting the camera was there um, before anything useful came of it because it, it would come across to the audience like I was just very much performative in a way. And so I had to... Um, just let the camera be integrated in, into my daily life. And oft times there would be long periods where we wouldn't do anything but just connect, you know, with my, my creative team. And after a while we grew pretty close and I was able to forget the camera and that's when the real stuff started coming out. So it worked out. So when you were incarcerated, was that your first introduction to art or had you had experience before that? Yeah, um, I wish I could show more of that. I, I was the talented um, kid in school who everyone wanted to draw, wanted acts to draw, help with their drawing. Um, I would come to church on a Sunday like this and present my drawings to my pastor who would, um, show them to the congregation. And uh, it really was encouraging to, to have that because I didn't always get it as a child, but it, it's always been there. Um, and I didn't always know that it was this viable option for a career path, but impulsively I did it anyway. And I would find encouragement in, in random places and by the time I found myself incarcerated, I saw that as my opportunity to um, really study and take it seriously. And, and that's a big part of what makes me thankful for having that time to sit down and, and find a sense of purpose and passion. So, yes. 
Hi. Hello. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around what it must have been like to transition from 11 years of incarceration to, and I know it didn't happen overnight, but to be in a very prestigious uh, uh, place in New York City, and I think it's real telling that the halfway house was, it, it's almost like they're setting you up for um, going back in and you didn't. W would, would you be able to talk a little bit about, I mean, did you feel like you were two different people? What, yeah, if you, if you wouldn't mind talking just a little bit about the transition, maybe what were challenging obstacles, what just, yeah. Uh, how, how, you, how the fuck you did it? <laughs> it's a great question. And um, thank you for, for being so frank because I often ask myself the same question. Um, oftentimes it felt like a level of espionage. Like I was um, somehow wearing a mask that would eventually have to come off. And that if they just knew the real me, that, that I wouldn't be here. And um, it was very much a spirit of redemption and, and a sense of wanting to like prove statistics wrong. You know, I knew the statistics said that two out of three people would recidivize and, and, and go back. And I saw that set up, or I felt that feeling of a trap immediately, and that's why we wanted to show some, some uh, visuals of what that neighborhood was like, but the, the clips you saw here really doesn't do it justice. But inside I knew that there was this expectation for me to fail, and I wanted to really tear holes in that statistic. I wanted to to prove that wrong, but at the same time, it inspired me as well. And so after doing 10 years and spending every day imagining what I'm gonna do, creating a plan, refining that plan, um, it was just a matter of action. And so I, I got to the halfway house and implemented this plan that involve me going to art workshops. And at the art workshops, I mean, I needed to get training and Atlanta didn't have um, a lot of uh, art training for some reason. It, you know, it's a met big metropolitan city, but they're not, they didn't have classical art uh, training there. But what, what going to the workshops did was put me in a room full of people from a different background and I shared my story with people like you all, and they said, wait, this is different. And they, they began to actually hoist me up and lift me up. And I took one step at a time, believing that, that there was just so much more for me than, than my upbringing. One of the best decisions I made was not returning to the same um, uh, conditions or the place that, that contributed to my incarceration. Um, it was a great decision to do that and I was around people I, I'd never be around in, in a lifetime had I not made that decision. And I would hear these conversations, you know, people talking about, oh yeah, you know, when I went to France and when I went to Italy and when I went to all of these amazing places and I wouldn't be able to contribute much to these culture topics and I, I would get to school and they'd be talking about operas and plays and things that I've never experienced and, and um, I would later begin to go and experience these things but it, it really motivated me uh, as well and so one step at a time one day at a time I swear it was like the universe was winking at me in the form of um, like people popping up at the right time opportunities at the right time, it seemed like weekly, it was almost something completely supernatural happening. And when that stuff is happening, and it seems like no one can see it but you, it's really humbling. And I just continued to push forward and, and take a step forward on the basis of that, and I was propelled further and further 
Um, before long, I just grew used to it and I started expecting miracles. Um, so that was my reality. I know you've been waiting. No, you, you've been answering my question. <laughs> my question was, starting with the language that you apologized for, it was perfectly understandable in that context. And what is, it has been impressing me is how you're able to have a conversation with all these different audiences and be able to communicate uh, with that, that individual or that group and uh, be able to make those transitions. I was just wondering how that developed and you've been answering that. So uh, oh, wow. I really appreciate that. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, if there's nothing else I can add to that, maybe I'll, I'll continue to um, come back to that as um, I answer more questions. Are we gonna do another clip or you wanna continue?
So I um, would go to school and it was a dream come true to get accepted at such a prestigious art academy. Um, and part of the training, they, they'd have us draw um, these plastered casts of different historical figures um, that they believe embodied the, the aesthetic principles that they wanted to teach. And so in all cases, they were always um, um, European uh, identities. And I, I really enjoyed the, the learning opportunity that that presented. I'd been waiting my whole life for that moment because in prison, I would write letters to a lot of the very artists who are in my network today and seek mentorship and I got no reply. Um, and so when I got to Florence Academy, it was just, I was on fire because um, it, it was just this opportunity that I never imagined. I mean, the only time I, I saw places like that was on television as a kid. And now I'm, I'm walking through the streets of New York and um, eventually in Florence, Italy. And I began to attack it with the hunger unlike anything they had ever seen. I was often the first student to arrive, the last to leave every day. My uh, director and instructor, um, I saw him and so many of his colleagues in the art magazines that I would subscribe to in prison and literally salivate over at mail call. I couldn't wait to get our our mail, because I knew I'd have some book or magazine on the way. And one of the magazines had my principal instructor and director in it, so that on the first day of my arrival there, uh, I brought this tattered magazine that I had in prison, and I gave it to him and said, hey, I won't be needing this anymore. And that really touched him. Um, and so right away, they knew that they were dealing with someone different and unlike the other student body. And so it wasn't uncommon for, for them to just say, hey, George, just lock up when you leave um, or just expect that I would be there upon their arrival early in the morning. Um, inclement weather, I was there when everyone else was leaving at four to go party or go to the bar. Um, I would, I would be the one there because I knew that that was an opportunity of a lifetime. Yet there were things that, that um, kind of perpetuated um, the, um, kind of the white supremacist ideals in the, uh, like I said, in the cast and the depictions of um, paintings on the wall. There was just no one that, that looked like me. And I, was, I wasn't entirely naive to the history, but at the same time, I, I, had, I had these rosy colored glasses on and just happy to be there. But at the same time, I knew I had to do something about it. And so um, I was the student who was um, um, encouraging more diversity within that setting, and I, I, I've been able to accomplish that as well. Um, so it was an incredible experience, and I think, I think we've been able to shift things as a result of my being the first African American to actually make it through such a rigorous program. But I, I, I would see in the text, you know, we'd be reading philosophical stuff like Kant and, um, others, and um, I would see commentary about how Africans can't depict reality, can't perceive reality and conceptualize it and put it down on the canvas. They can only do primitive, abstract work. And that, for me, is like, it was fuel, because I wanted to like prove some of that wrong, and um, these types of adversity actually helped in that sense. It gave me something that, that inspired me. And um, I, I really do believe it, it is changing the academies um, as well. I'm, 
going to talk later about how exactly how that's happening, uh, but I'll open up for questions. Um, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate your your work and your time. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about your process when you're when you're painting or you're drawing portraits of people. Um, do you have to like establish a connection or a trust or a relationship ahead of time? Or does that kind of come throughout the process as you're painting them? Is it important to kind of depict them as you see them? Or do you try to like kind of dig into who they are to have that influence your art? Absolutely. Thank you for your question. Yes, I, I definitely believe in painting people who um, I, I feel a strong connection to. And I, I do try to establish that. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm more driven by like the ontological aspect of painting, which is process driven, not necessarily busy with the outcome. Uh, I, I try, it's hard, but for me, you know how they say, um, the journey is better than the destination. Um, I've learned to just fall in love with the process, the learning that takes place, the um, sense of human connection, as you mentioned, and the ability to just kind of respond and react to what's happening in the moment in a way. Um, and it's, it's deeply rewarding because it allows what people have come to know today as this thing called flow state where you're just in the moment and you're, you're kind of reacting to what's happening. And yeah, sometimes in that exchange, in that dialogue, there is um, happy accidents, things, things go in a different direction. And it's a process of learning and initiation. And by the time I'm finished, um, I've learned so much. Uh, and, and there is something special about the human interaction that, that I really look forward to. And it's a large part of why um, I believe in painting from life, directly from nature as much as possible because um, that, of that connection. Just to follow up on that same question, when did you learn how to capture your subject's soul so well? It was, it was definitely in school, I, I would say that prior to school, I had enough innate ability that people could tell that, that I should probably challenge that. Like in one of the clips you saw a painting that I did in the gym of a gym owner. This was prior to school and there was some ability, but when I, by the time I, I, I got to the Florence Academy, I was learning all of these principles and concepts about painting from life and we had to study anatomy and uh, color and perspective and all the technical things that, that would help for me to um, understand what's in front of me and it's, it's challenging for sure. Um, but I would say uh, my teachers, I owe a great deal to them, the Florence Academy of Art they really pushed me. Uh, we, those, those casts that I'm talking about and the other various projects, it was like a rigorous amount of hours spent perfecting it. And once I thought I had pushed it as far as I could, they would come around and say, nope, you still need to do this, you need to do that. And it would be weeks more on the same project where I thought I'd reached my limit. And that really stretched my uh, capacity for um, um, somehow getting the image re as refined and perfected as possible. Um, I was watching you last night on the internet from the church, and you were uh, you were explaining the um, you, you took your nephew to the art museum, and you were in front of this Egyptian uh, sculpture, and you were explaining to your nephew the uh, Egyptian system of immortality. Mm -hmm. Then you brought it back down to his own, his own spirit. How did you do that? It's the books I read, man. Like, 
Um, honestly, I, I feel like I, when I was away, and even in the clip that you saw where I'm showing my tattoos, um, I would learn things and tattoo it on my body, on my back. This is weird. I have this huge pyramid concept. And before I, this is before I knew that I would actually be giving tours throughout the pyramids. Um, but it was something about indelibly marking it on my body that became a self-fulfilling prophecy somehow. Um, but the books I was reading informed this understanding that, that you reference. And, you know, whether it's different religious books, even the Bible, all the sacred texts, um, seem to come back to the self, the human mind, and, and um, I was always related to myself. I mean, it was great to, to learn about um, all the, the narratives, the historical nar narratives and different allegories and mythologies, but it, it, for me, my interpretation, all, it, it all came back down to the individual and, and you being your own hero um, and, and, and traveling your own hero's journey. I love Joseph Campbell for that. Um, and I would go to these places as well. And so when I go there and I, I really sought to understand the inner meanings of a lot of these sacred texts, which is tens of thousands of years old, carved into the walls over there, um, that was the understanding I came, came away with. And I, I, I wanted to simplify it. Like one of my favorite authors, Wayne Dyer, he passed away, he used to just, take the most elevated and abstract stuff. He, he retranslated the Tao Te Ching, for example, and just made it so simple for the average layperson to understand. And I've always admired people who could do that. And so in that instance, I realized I was talking to just this 11-year-old kid who's asking me about um, Egypt. And this, we're looking at this complicated um, ritual and art being performed on that coffin in the clip that you reference, And I knew that all of their uh, so-called like polytheistic uh, deities represented aspects of the self, um, or even in psychological terms, what Jung would call archetypes. Um, and so I see the oneness of the, the various faith traditions and um, I like to think that it's all pointing us back to these different aspects of ourself. And so I wanted to impart that to him so that he'd understand that we're not dealing with something far off and super complex, but this, this is how it relates to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, to me, I believe that humility is an essential element to change. And I perceive you as having a lot of humility. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that has played in your life and, and the changes you've been able to make in different places. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, I would say my life has naturally kind of kept me humble. Uh, no matter how far I go, the places I go, I, I, I always come back home and, and see my family and people that are close to me still struggling. And that naturally keeps me close to remembering um, what it's like, um, how difficult it can be for some. And it, it also empowers and inspires me as well. And being so close to that, it just seems natural for me to be forever reminded that if it weren't for grace, there go I, right? Um, and so it's not something that I have to try to uh, do maybe as much as other people who may experience such uh, experiences that most people would consider like this level of success or transformation or you know, being able to go so far I've always remained uh, in touch with my roots. And so I, I would say that is what has helped me the most because I'm 
even throughout the film, you see I, I can be on scaffolding looking at the most famous painting, The Night Watch, in the world in Amsterdam. And if you see the film, shortly after that, I'm on a call um, with my mom who's needing to get bailed out of jail just a few hours up the road in Kansas City. And I'm, next thing you know, I'm back in Kansas City bailing her out. Um, my, my life naturally keeps me grounded in that sense. And so I'm thankful for it, but at the same time, it, it, it does cause some stress, but that's life. Hey, sir, um, thank you again for coming. We have one more in there. I see you, yeah. Sorry. No. Hey, sir, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I was really intrigued by how you found distinctions between Eurocentric art and African art. And I was curious what you found was most interesting or differences that you weren't taught in school about the art that you create. Good question. That's uh, the question. Like, um, like, so you have, you painted all these plaster casts of Eurocentric folks. And of course you go home to paint your family, to paint people you grow up with. What is the major difference or most interesting difference to you? I would say the skull features, like the phrenology of the skull, craniometry, and, and noticing um, when I'm painting one ethnic group, the angles and the features um, of a, maybe a European skull has like this perfect vertical. And um, the Greeks made that this ideal standard. And, and then, you know, I go to Egypt and I see the Sphinx which has this prognathism where the lower jaw protrudes more in front of the forehead. And I see that in more Afri African skulls. And I, I really kind of geek out about like the, um, that, uh, and the, those anatomical differences. And at the same time, um, the skin tones, um, it's, in, in certain uh, African skin tones is so rich with color. And it's in history, um, they haven't been necessarily depicted much, except if you go through the museums, you see them as this silhouetted kind of presence that doesn't have an identity. And they're more of like this object of power or prop for their, their master. And for me, being able to depict them in a dignified way felt um, like, a, a, like a revolutionary act, just giving, giving them dignity. Um, so that, that would be a difference in the depictions in, in, as opposed to how I saw it um, historically. But definitely, the, it's the anatomical features. There's nuanced differences that I love to celebrate, of course. Am I next? Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for the courage to tell your story. It's amazing, and it's thank wonderful, you. and it's um, inspirational, so thank you. I also want to take an opportunity quickly to thank some of the folks in this room who are working tirelessly every day to make sure that the horrific system that you grew up in is fixed. Yes, thank and, you. And the, yeah, their, can... their groups in here, yeah. their groups in this community, and I want to thank them for that. Sure. I've got a multitude of questions. Um, I am a state legislator, so mm. I am in the state trying to figure out how to um, take the inspiration from your story and the, um, the places where you've been and the things that you've learned to try to make it better for those folks. First of all, we're trying to keep them out of prison, right. but then those folks that are in prison, how can we take your lessons learned and and, and help them build those lives. So I've got several questions about that. First of all, I'd love to have a list of the books that you've read, <laughs> personally, um, as, well as, um, as well as for those in prison. The other thing is, the elephant in the room always is money. Mm. And how did you pay for the workshops? How did you pay for Life Outside? Did you have a patron? Did you have help from, um, I know it's not from the government, or it wouldn't be from the Arkansas government anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so how does that happen? And then I'd love to hear your suggestions about how to take those lessons that you've learned and incorporate those ideas into the prison system 
so that we can make life better once once folks do get out. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, easy questions. Easy questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the title of today's lecture, More Light, um, we'll show a clip of uh, the inspiration behind it. Um, it's a reference from the film. It's a reference from Goethe, who was on his deathbed saying, uh, more light, more light, more light. And um, it's also the name of a, my nonprofit that is being incorporated as we speak. And part of the, the, the curriculum of the nonprofit is to extend my teaching studio named Atelier South, um, which is a studio in Atlanta, um, further into the communities and also into uh, the prisons for those who are system impacted. And it's a curriculum that's rooted in this idea of healing through creative practice. Um, and I just believe that we, we all do our part. You know, you find one person, if you can make a difference in one person's life, um, you've already left the world a better place than you found it. I mean, a lot of these um, systemic issues, um, it's hard for one individual to topple that. I mean, you're a state legislator, so you, you probably could um, do more than, than, than most. But I would say that that is a huge part of what my work is, you know, in addition to uh, making images that I hope will stand the test of time, is just raising up other people uh, who can maybe be inspired by that and, and, and tell their story through various art forms as well. A lot of the funding for um, my early, the earliest parts of my journey is strange. When I, was in, when I was in prison, I taught myself how to trade the financial markets. So I would, um, I would uh, be standing in front of the ticker symbol watching CNBC, and I used to like American Greed, that show would come on. I, I didn't watch a lot of TV, but I would always be in front of the ticker symbol getting the open high-low close of my favorite uh, uh, financial securities that I was trading, and I would go chart them by hand. Um, and while in Colorado, I was telling someone that um, I met the CEO of Enron named Jeff Skilling, who was incarcerated. <laughs> and, and I'm referencing that in the film. I'm telling my aunt, like, hey, I met these Ivy League guys, and she would send, he would tell me what books to get. And he's like, yeah, get John J. Murphy, uh, uh, technical analysis of the financial markets, get Buffett's books, get, um, uh, and he wasn't, this guy, he, was, he wasn't uh, necessarily into the technicals. He was, he was more into buy and hold. But he, he yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he, he, you know, people like him, by the time I got to what we call Club Fed, I had to work my way down from Leavenworth Maximum Security by painting pictures for the um, institution and finessing transfers, as I said, and uh, is that my cue? You're getting really close. Getting close. Finish that sentence. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, I started trading and I saved money from a few good trades. I kind of got in on Apple. Um, and people would um, um, ask me my tips because I knew how to use sacred geometry, what they call geometry, Fibonacci stuff for technical analysis, stuff I used for my composition. I used to um, study the charts. I had a few good trades, saved up a few thousand dollars. When I got out, I was able to pay for my workshops. And the workshops got me in, in the presence of some good people that were able to continue further um, hosting me up. We've got time for a Sharon's question. And then I'm going to show the last clip, and then okay. we'll have to finish. Sharon? Do you have a microphone? Here, let me hand you this one. A question. Good morning. It's Good morning. really great to see you and to, um, everybody here today. Um, Thank you. My question, it's, I'm not sure I can phrase it in a question form, um, but uh, we talk about uh, the gifts that you have. We talk about the experiences that you've had, that you've gone, you know, you had to spend 11 years of your youth um, 
incarcerated and that you were able to uh, navigate your, uh, your time and space to, to be that person that you've always been, really, that you had, uh, you popped out like that. And uh, there, are, there are so many that you met while you were there, likely, who somehow, for some particular reason, weren't able to um, achieve, you know, the, the outcome that, that you are able to achieve, right? Um, and I, I just wanted to, to uh, maybe just make it into a statement, if you would allow me, mm -hmm. that uh, we are not black people, you, uh, your brilliance, it's not really a unique thing. Right. That you're actually probably, I mean, your brains, I, I say uh, generally that your brains are, our brains are big to be able to solve, to be able to live through what you've done, and be able to enumerate the, the various um, settings and life experiences that you've had and still be here. Thank you. Um, and there are many of us out here like that, even if we're homeless. Mm. You know? Um, and I want our audience, the people that you know, we're sharing with today, to understand that this work is yours, that we have to uh, be who we become and still suffer mm -hmm. um, because it's not really our work to do. Mm -hmm. The work we're starting to do and having to do is not our work. Mm -hmm. And that we, you know, the examples of, of who we are that you get to see because we are you know, we, we want to share ourselves. And we are thinking beyond ourselves, mostly. Mm -hmm. That the questions that you have to ask or you feel like you need to ask are really your questions, questions that you must answer yourself. These questions are your questions. So uh, it's really great to hear them out loud. I, you know, I have a, a, a diverse life, and I know you do too, I'm sure. We all, you know, we do. Uh, and it's just really just the truth, really. And I know it can be hard. Uh, but responsibility is yours to do a similar kind of thing that we have to do every day of our lives from the time we pop out. So that's all I have to say about Thank the social you. aspect of that. I agree. May we watch the last clip? Yeah, yes.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. You bless us with your visit today. Don't forget to sign up to get an email link for the documentary if you would like to see it. Thank you. Of course.